Hello and a very warm welcome to a brand new edition of World Panorama with me, Frank Pereira on Rajya Sabha Television. Over the next half an hour, we'll bring you a roundup of all the significant events to have happened around the world this week. But first, a look at the headlines. Pakistan Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif rakes up Kashmir issue and glorifies Burhan Wani at United Nations General Assembly. India hits back calling Pakistan a terrorist state that carries out war crimes. World leaders approve a declaration that aims to provide a more coordinated and humane response to refugee crisis around the world. Migrants' issue takes center stage at UN General Assembly. Protests break out in Charlotte, North Carolina after police shoot 43-year-old black man. Governor declares a state of emergency and calls in the National Guard. Obama calls for peace. And violence resumes in Syria after a week-long fragile truce ends. Rebel-held areas of Aleppo see the heaviest airstrikes in months. Dozens killed in the northern Syrian city. Our top focus on the program this week, Pakistan Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif raked up the Kashmir issue on Wednesday at the United Nations General Assembly, glorifying slain Hizbul commander Burhan Wani as a young leader and demanding an independent inquiry into the extra judicial killings. India's response was swift, exercising its right to reply at the UN. India called Pakistan a terror state and said the country was allowing terror organizations to roam freely in its territory. Here's more. Even before Pakistan Prime Minister walked up to the dais to address the 71st annual United Nations General Assembly, it was amply clear that he would rake up the Kashmir issue. Devoting much of his 20-minute speech to Kashmir, Nawaz Sharif insisted that peace and normalization between Pakistan and India could not be achieved without a resolution of the Kashmir dispute. Interestingly, he pointed out that his country had gone the extra mile to achieve this. Pakistan wants peace with India. We have gone the extra mile to achieve this, repeatedly offering a dialogue to address all outstanding issues. But India has posed unacceptable preconditions to engage in a dialogue. While pointing out his country's so-called efforts to achieve peace, Sharif glorified the slain Hezbul militant Burhan Wani as a young leader adding that Pakistan fully supports the demand of the Kashmiri people for self-determination. Sharif went on to say that Indian brutalities in Kashmir were well documented and that Pakistan would share with the Secretary General evidence of violations of human rights in Jammu and Kashmir. He added that Pakistan wanted stability in Southeast Asia. Pakistan is committed to the establishment of strategic stability in the region. It neither wants nor is it engaged in an arms race with India. But we cannot ignore our neighbors' unprecedented arms build-up and will take whatever measures are necessary to maintain credible deterrence. With his address at the UNGA, Nawaz Sharif continues his efforts to internationalize the Kashmir situation. He has already written to the UN and world leaders, sent out political envoys to major capitals and even dedicated this year's Eid ul Zuha to Kashmiris to highlight the so-called Kashmir cause. However, all this has not even remotely evoked the response that Pakistan had hoped for. US has now asked Pakistan to cooperate with India in probing the terror attack on the army base in Kashmir's Uri. Bureau Report, Rajya Sabha TV. Meanwhile, India called Pakistan a terrorist state that hosts the Ivy League of Terrorism while responding to Prime Minister Nawaz Sharif's speech at the UNGA. The response marked the latest round in a war of words that has escalated after Sunday's terror attack on an army camp in Uri that killed 18 soldiers. India also said that the onus is now on Pakistan to act against terrorist groups engaging in cross-border attacks while threatening to withdraw or downgrade the most favoured nation status granted in 1996. The land of Takshila, one of the greatest learning centers of ancient times, is now host to the Ivy League of Terrorism. It attracts aspirants and apprentices from all over the world. 
the effect of its toxic curriculum are felt across the globe. What we see in Pakistan, Mr. President, is a terrorist state which analyzes billions of dollars, much of it diverted from international aid to training, financing, and supporting terrorist groups as militant proxies against its neighbors. Terrorist entities and their leaders, including many designated by the UN, continue to roam its streets freely and operate with state support. It was shocking that a leader of, the na of a nation can glorify a self-declared, a self-advertised terrorist at such, at a, such a forum. This is self-incrimination by the Pakistan Prime Minister. Meanwhile, you know, MEA spokesperson Vikas Swaroop also countered Nawaz Sharif's allegations. He also said that mutual trust and cooperation were needed for the 56-year-old Indus Water Treaty to work. This assertion came amid calls in India for the government to scrap the Water Distribution Pact. There are differences between India and Pakistan on the implementation of the Indus Water Treaty. But this is an issue which is being addressed bilaterally. But let me make a basic point. Eventually, any cooperative arrangement requires goodwill and mutual trust on both sides. Well, join me for a chat this week to talk about this is the consulting editor of The Telegraph, Mr. K.P. Nair. Mr. Nair, welcome and thank you for joining me on the program. Thank you. Much has transpired since URI happened uh, a week ago in, uh, in Kashmir, of course, and we've seen that uh, the issue has been raised at the UNGA. Pakistan first raking up the issue and then India giving it a befitting response. Your take on everything that's happened. Frank, I have been uh, covering the United Nations since 1995. That's uh, 21 uh, years now. Uh, Nawaz Sharif's uh, speech in which he raked up Kashmir should be seen in the backdrop of one of the secrets about the UN General Assembly, which most people don't know about. These speeches in the first week of the uh, general debate, uh, when uh, there are uh, 120 to 150 prime ministers, presidents, kings in uh, New York, nobody listens to these speeches. These, uh, that week is actually uh, the diplomatic uh, equivalent of the Kumbh Mela. Mm. There are about uh, 70 to 80 parties every day. There are numerous lunches, other things going on. So nobody actually goes to the General Assembly Hall. Sometimes uh, third secretaries uh, sit in the place of uh, countries. Quite often, ambassadors bring in cooks, ayahs, bearers, and drivers to fill the seats. Because uh, say, if the Prime Minister of Bangladesh is there and the hall is empty, the ambassador gets into trouble. Mm. So nobody actually, virtually nobody listens to uh, these speeches, including Nawaz Sharif's. People listen to Obama or Chavez or Castro because they are charismatic uh, personalities. Having said that, everybody reads the speeches. See, this weekend, uh, all the uh, counselors in the various missions will be going through all the speeches because they have to send reports to their headquarters about uh, the analysis about the General Assembly. Mm -hmm. So when the speeches are read and analyzed, it will be uh, Inam Gambhir's uh, right to reply which he exercised on behalf of India, which will grab everybody's attention. Because it was, it was a great speech, the words were crafted so well and she is a very bright young officer who knows Pakistan. She dealt with Pakistan before going to uh, New York on a posting in the headquarters. And those words about Taxila, everybody, you know, if you are an ambassador in the UN, you know about Taxila. Those words about Taxila now being the uh, Ivy League of Terror. That is the speech that will be read in every chancellery in, uh, across the world when the analysis goes back. So on balance, I think India has reason to be satisfied about the uh, first week of the General Assembly because uh, Nawaz Sharif's speech, 70% of which he devoted to India-Pakistan issues, it was a drone, you know, mm. it was mm. a dull monologue. But 
India, I think, got away with uh, a better start in in this general Indeed. assembly session. Another issue that has been uh, spoken about and that was raised was by the MEA spokesperson Vikas Varup, who raised the uh, the Indus Water Treaty issue. Now, your take on that, in, because it's a very tricky issue. It's been uh, you know the treaty has been in force for almost 60 years now, and suddenly you've seen it being you know spoken about again. What's likely to happen on that front? One never knows what is likely to happen because it, the ultimate call will be taken by the uh, Prime Minister. But uh, scrapping the treaty has been an option for a long time. It has mm. been discussed several times. And the very fact that uh, through several crises, including wars with Pakistan, the treaty has not been scrapped, that says something because it's, it's very complicating. You know, I mean, uh, I heard MJ Akbar talk about self-incrimination. Abrogating the treaty could be a form of self-incrimination uh, in, in real terms. Because, uh, see, what do we do with the water? Okay, you don't give it to Pakistan. What happens to the water? It comes into uh, Indian lands, you know. So many parts of uh, Punjab, Haryana, Himachal Pradesh could be flooded uh, if we stop supplying water to the uh, Pakistanis. So, uh, in these situations, in diplomatic terms, it is much better to talk about it, you know. Right. A threat is more effective than, than action. Because if there is a threat, it will also attract international attention. Indeed. But Indeed. if we abrogate the treaty, my feeling is that we will also have trouble because of inundation. And then two rivers start in China. Mm. Supposing the Chinese decide to do something with Indus waters and uh, Sutledge waters, then again uh, we have problem. Indeed, the China aspect of it is always there. Thank you so much, Mr. Nair, for joining us on the program and putting things into perspective for us. Well, moving on now, the world leaders on Monday approved a declaration that aims to provide a more coordinated and humane response to the refugee crisis around the globe. The issue of what to do about the 65 million displaced people worldwide took center stage at the UN General Assembly with leaders from the 193 member states taking part in the first ever summit and addressing large movements of refugees and migrants. Here's a report. Up to 4,000 migrants being evacuated from the Muria camp on the Greek island of Lesbos after a large fire destroyed their tent homes. Turkish Coast Guard intercepting 61 migrants trying to sail to Lesbos from the Turkish town of Ayvasik. Horror stories on plight of migrants around the world are being reported on a daily basis as the world faces a migrant crisis with the staggering 65 million people displaced from their homes across the planet. On Monday, world leaders came together at the United Nations to adopt the New York Declaration, which expresses their political will to protect the right of refugees and migrants to save lives and share responsibility for large movements on a global scale. The New York Declaration marks a political commitment of unprecedented force and resonance. It fills what has been a perennial gap in the international protection system that of truly sharing responsibility for refugees in the spirit of the United Nations Charter. The declaration contains bold commitments both to address current issues and to prepare the world for future challenges. It takes a pledge to protect the human rights of all refugees and migrants, ensure that all refugee and migrant children are receiving education within a few months of arrival, prevent and respond to sexual violence, support those countries who are rescuing and hosting refugees and migrants, stop detaining children to determine their migration status, find new homes for all refugees and bringing international organization for migration into the UN system. My colleagues, the world knows what it must do to respond effectively to the massive challenge that we face. But we have to apply the knowledge systematically and we need the resources to be able to do so before it is too late. The migrant crisis has been growing for several years and with 21.3 million refugees across the globe, the need for action has never been greater. 
The promises may prove to be an uphill struggle at a time when refugees and migrants have become a divisive issue in Europe and the United States. And in the face of lack of consensus, there is a real danger that the declaration, an outcome document which contains no concrete commitments and is not legally binding, may fall short of what is needed. Bureau report, Rajya Sabhati. Well, it's time for a short break now, but still to come, protests break out on the streets of Charlotte, North Carolina after an African-American is fatally shot by police. Governor declares state of emergency after protests get out of hand. That and much more still to come. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. Welcome back. You're watching Rajya Sabha Television. Well, protests broke out in Charlotte, North Carolina after a 43-year-old black man was shot dead by police earlier this week. Governor Pat McCory declared a state of emergency and called in the National Guard after Charlotte's police chief said that he needed the help. What started out on Wednesday evening as a prayer vigil after Scott's shooting turned into an angry march and then resulted in violence. Here are the details. by a fatal shooting of an African-American in North Carolina. Police officials claimed the victim had a gun when they approached him in a parking lot, a version that was heatedly disputed by eyewitnesses. The man was sitting in his car, okay. minding his business. I heard his wife yelling down, running down from where they stay. Don't do it. Please don't. I looked over here because I'm looking at where she's running at, and that's when I see the man standing there with the gun pointing at Mr. What's his name? Mr. Johnson? Scott. Mr. Scott. Pointing at Mr. Scott. He's standing there like this, telling them I don't have anything. When they did that, you hear four shots. Boom, 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 boom. That man hit the ground, they, and then they just standing there looking at him. The victim, identified as 43-year-old Keith Lamont Scott, was shot by Officer Brentley Winson on Tuesday afternoon. I can tell you uh, a weapon was seized, a handgun. Um, I can also tell you we did not find a book that has been made reference to. They, they replaced it. it with a gun. That's what they did. They took the book and replaced it with a gun. Because that man, he sits out here every day. His son rides and goes to school with my daughter. That man sits out here every day and waits on his son to get off the bus. Do you understand how that, how that baby had to come home to that? About a dozen police officers and many protesters suffered injuries in the hour-long demonstration. Protesters on Wednesday also blocked the Interstate 85 where they stole boxes from trucks and started fires. And I'm a black guy, so when I see this, I'm thinking any, any given moment I get pulled over or stopped or a cop comes, it's, it's likely I'm going to get shot, armed or not, I'm going to get shot. It's been growing, people getting shot everywhere, man. So it's, if you're a black guy, you probably, you probably should be scared because we're the ones getting shot. Police used flash grenades to disperse the angry crowd. Later, as the demonstrations gathered pace, police in riot gear used tear gas on the protesters who threw rocks and water bottles at them. What we're standing up for now is our black manhood and our black people who are being gunned down in the street and we don't get no justice. So what I'm calling for and what we're calling for is an economic boycott of the whole city of Charlotte. Since black lives do not matter for this city, then our black dollar shouldn't matter. Right? That's Keep right. our money in our pocket and let you feel. See, we're watching uh, modern day lynching on social media, on television, and it is affecting the psyche of black people. That's what you saw last night. Scott was allegedly shot dead when officers were at an apartment complex searching for a suspect with a warrant. The department claimed that they saw Scott get out of his vehicle with a firearm. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Well, violence resumed in Syria now after a week-long fragile truce ended on Monday. Several airstrikes in and around Aleppo killed dozens, including 12, who were killed in an attack on a UN aid convoy. Now, the UN has suspended all aid convoys to Syria after the attack and the White House has held Russia responsible. Just 
hours after a week-long truce ended, Syria plunged back into violence almost immediately. Dozens of airstrikes in and around Aleppo killed more than 30 people, also hitting a UN aid convoy. 18 of 31 lorries containing wheat, winter clothes and medical supplies were destroyed in the airstrike. The UK-based Syrian Observatory for Human Rights said that strikes were carried out by Syrian or Russian planes. The Russian uh, and the regime helicopter targeted these uh, trucks. These trucks full of humanitarian aid, medicine and mattress uh, for the Syrian Christians. Here is based the warehouse of Syrian Christians. Here is the warehouse of the Syrian Christians. It also targeted by the barrel bomb of the helicopter. Following the attack, the United Nations has suspended all aid convoy movements in Syria besides condemning the killing of people. Aid deliveries to besieged areas have been a key part of the cessation of hostilities deal brokered last week. The United Nations has been forced to suspend aid convoys as a result of this outrage. The humanitarians delivering life-saving aid were heroes. Those who bombed them were cowards. Accountability for crimes such as these is essential. I appeal to all those with influence to end the fighting and get talks started. Diplomats from the United States, Russia and other major and regional powers met in New York to explore ways to revive the ceasefire. The US called on Russia to control Assad. Russia, however, says a rebel attack on a government position in Aleppo prompted the response, denying any involvement in the attack on the UN convoy. Well, the Syrians do not didn't make the deal. The Russians made the agreement, so we need to see what the Russians say. But the point, uh, the important thing is, the Russians need to control Assad, who evidently is indiscriminately bombing, including on humanitarian convoys. From the beginning, the truce had been beset by difficulties and mutual accusations of violations, and now with no ceasefire in place, only more damage is expected. Moreover, failure of humanitarian aid reaching the besieged areas has only compounded the problems. Bureau report, Rajya Sabha TV. Meanwhile, much else has unfolded around the world this week. Here's a roundup of the other international news of the week in Globe Watch. Well, let's now shift focus and bring you up to speed with all the sports news that you might have missed this week in sports action. Wimbledon champion Andy Murray is not overly enthusiastic about the possibility of a neutral venue hosting the Davis Cup finals, but backed proposals to shorten matches in the competition. The International Tennis Federation is considering plans to select fixed venue cities in advance for the Davis and Fed Cup finals, switching from the current format where one of the finalists hosts the decider. Croatia will host Argentina for the 2016 Davis Cup title after winning their semi-finals last weekend, but a host city has yet to be named. Spanish tennis star Rafael Nadal denied accusations of illegal doping after being named in the latest series of leaks by the Russian hacker group Fancy Bears. The group claims to have breached the files of the World Anti-Doping Agency and uncovered the identities of athletes permitted to take prohibited products for supposedly therapeutic reasons. Although Nadal admitted he had taken such products, he insisted that he had done nothing wrong. Manchester United manager Jose Mourinho lashed out at football's Einsteins for criticising him during the English Premier League club's run of three successive defeats. Despite winning the first four games of his tenure, Mourinho has come under scrutiny from the media after United slump in form with the club currently six points behind leaders Manchester City in the league. United returned to winning ways after beating third side Northampton Town 3-1 in the third round of the League Cup on Wednesday. Manchester rivals United and City will face each other at Old Trafford in the fourth round of the EFL Cup. United saw off League One side Northampton while City won 2-1 at Swansea to set up the second meeting of the two teams this season following City's derby win on the 10th of September. Elsewhere, West Ham will host London rivals Chelsea while Tottenham travel to Liverpool. Ties will be played on the week beginning 24th of October. 
Lionel Messi will be out for three weeks after suffering a groin strain in Barcelona's draw with Atletico Madrid. The striker went off on 59 minutes on Wednesday after a Diego Godin tackle. He was forced to miss Argentina's World Cup 2008 qualifier against Venezuela earlier this month with a groin injury, but played in all five La Liga games for his club this season. The Argentine could return for Barca's Champions League tie with Manchester City on the 18th of October. An evening concert was held on Thursday to celebrate the end of a costly and lengthy restoration project on the iconic Spanish Steps. The concert titled A Tribute to the Spanish Steps was performed by the orchestra Nacionale di Santa Cecilia, conducted by Antonio Papano. Rome is reopening the famed landmark after the privately funded restoration but was, has urged visitors to treat the 18th century staircase with greater respect and prevent it from falling again into disrepair. I'm going to leave you with these visuals of the concert. See you again next time.